the strong king, as we all know, for four reasons. For fair pay and pensions for all staff. In protest at gender and racial pay gaps. Casualization of staff contracts and dangerously unsustainable workloads. Today I'm going to talk about my own experience of the impacts of excessive workload. It includes some difficult topics that have deeply affected many of us, as well as our families, friends and colleagues. It's important that we don't suppress the important and often agonizing workload experience of our colleagues, nor our own experiences. But equally, it's really important that we don't use colleagues as propaganda. And for this reason, I won't be talking about a particular person by name, although I'm aware that many of you will know exactly who I do mean. If you're upset by anything that follows, please speak to me or Renata here, or anyone in a pink hat. We'll be able to point you in the direction of some good support. So many of us have pivotal moments in our lives when everything changed and when we knew that nothing would be the same again. A turning point in my own life came one morning in March 2014, when news came through that a member of academic staff in the School of Biosciences had died. This was a heavy blow to me as it was a close colleague. Someone I saw as a mentor and a friend, as well as a senior member of our teaching team. A good scientist, and one of the funniest of workmates with an unhealthy admiration for Alan Partridge. <laughs> he was a family man, he had a wife, and he had a son in sixth form, and a son at university. Previous summers we'd spent weeks together running field courses for ecology students in Skomer Island. So news of his death came as a deep shock to me and many others, both staff and students. And we could only imagine the impact on his family. But as that March day unfolded, the news became more and more horrific. He had died at work, in his own office, and uh, he had taken his own life. He had given one lecture in the morning, then failed to arrive for a second lecture. Our students had become concerned and reported his absence, and by the end of the working day, his distraught family had raised the alarm and a member of our security staff had found him in his office. A very traumatic sequence of events for everyone. The following morning, students turned up for a tutorial with him to find his office taped off. Our security staff and professional services staff felt numbed, not just by the loss of a friend or colleague, but also because we knew that it could so easily have been any one of us. We were all under the crippled crippling pressure of excessive and poorly managed workloads that we all know so well. For example, when our school eventually started collecting workload data, it transpired that in my own case, I had just over twice the university's maximum recommended teaching load for my role. This gave me 150 minutes a week for all of my research, postgrad supervision, outreach and admin. No, many, no wonder many of us felt desperate and helpless. Any suicide has complex causes, and I appreciate that excessive workload is not the only cause of the workplace suicide that I'm talking about. However, the fear and despair felt by many staff in biosciences, including myself, was very revealing of how close to home this event was, given our repeated and emphatic warnings of dangerously unsustainable workloads over a period of several years. These warnings were given, including by my lost colleague, through our PDRs, in teaching meetings, and through our research divisions. These warnings, unfortunately and inexplicably, went unanswered. Emails to the head of department at the time are revealing of these concerns. Here's an extract of an email from me to the head of school at the time who had stated that he needed to Google the name of our dead colleague in order to find out who he was. I wrote, it's not simply, it's simply not good enough to state you're not aware of any problem with stress that our colleague was suffering, when our entire research division 
has been highlighting concerns about workload, workplace stress and management for several years, and especially over the last few months prior to this event. These concerns have been repeatedly minuted in research division meetings and staff appraisal, and referred to in letters and emails. This email sadly went unanswered. At the inquest into our colleagues' death, which I attended along with other members of academic staff and members of the school management team, but notably the head of school did not attend. At the inquest, the coroner made the following comments. Given such a tragic incident, it's only right and proper that the university takes the opportunity to reflect on the issues raised by the evidence presented at the inquest. I'm still not sure that the university has ever properly addressed the coroner's comments. Certainly the School of Biosciences has never published a formal response. Five years later, I don't have answers to any of this. I'm still grieving the loss of a friend and colleague. I'm just saying that our concerns then and now need to be heard and treated the, with the seriousness that they deserve. I'm saying that these are literally life and death concerns. The responsibility of university managers is immense. That's presumably why they're paid the big bucks. More specifically, our emails need to be replied to. Our vice chancellor needs to turn up to open meetings to address serious staff concerns about his conduct. Specifically, we demand that RVC ensures that staff are properly paid, both now and after they retire. We demand that RVC deals with racist and sexist pay inequality. And we demand that RVC addresses the ongoing workload crisis and the endemic mental ill health that results. In other words, we demand that RVC, Colin Reardon, does his job for which he is paid so much. In other words, where are you, Colin? Your hiding is laughable. If you see yourself as a credible leader, come and talk to your staff. Over to you, Colin. The ball is in your court. Thank you, Rob.